So that's the first great thing that happens. The second great thing that happens are the signs and wonders that the apostles work and what happens when they're persecuted. Uh, Acts chapter 5 verse 12 talks about the great things they were doing. There was a porch on the eastern side of the temple called Solomon's porch. We see the Lord Jesus there in John chapter 10. And evidently, the temple was a big, huge place. And evidently, that's where the Christians gathered. That's where they preach, and that's where they would praise. And that's where the sick people were brought to them, and they would do um, tremendous things. Verse 15, Acts 5.15, seems to take it to a higher level. Not only were the apostles able to heal people, but the very shadow of Peter seem to heal people. And, um, you know, at one point, um, pieces of cloth that he had touched seemed to retain a kind of healing power that could help people. So, so mighty was the power coming through the apostles. Well, that was the experience of the apostles. The high priests, who claimed to be the favorites of God, who claimed to have power from God, but who had rejected Christ, they're noticing all these things that are going on in their backyard. The apostles are having this dynamic, dramatic, powerful ministry, and they're making converts. And the chief priests enjoy their position. They've gotten rich with this position. They like holding the position. And they see the danger of the position slipping out of their hands if these Christians keep getting stronger and stronger. So they're not going to take it lying down. They're going to do something about it. And so uh, it says in verse 17 that they're filled with jealousy, so they order the apostles imprisoned again. Now look at verse 19. An angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison and took them out. I want to say two or three things about this. Um, We will never know God as a deliverer. We will never know God as the God of deliverances, the God of release, unless we have some difficulty, some danger, some emergency that He needs to deliver us from. If we never encounter danger, if we never embrace risk, if we never suffer, if we never have some threat being held over us, we will never know God as a God of deliverances because there'll never be anything for Him to deliver us from. They knew God as a God of deliverances. Now, let me say a second thing. He doesn't always deliver us. We're going to see this in Acts 12. And by the way, in the future history of Peter, Peter was executed in Rome either A.D. 67 or A.D. 68, probably A.D. 67. A time would come when Peter would not be delivered. Sometimes God delivers us and sometimes He doesn't. On this occasion in Acts 4, Peter was delivered. On another occasion in Acts 12, Peter was delivered. In 67 A.D. in Rome, Peter was not delivered. He was crucified. So, 100% of our experience is not always peace and safety and deliverance. On this occasion, it was. Now, you can imagine how the priests felt when these men had been uh, in prison, and then the next morning they said, bring those prisoners here, and the jailer says, we can't find the prisoners. The door is locked, but they're gone, and we don't know how they got out. And then they discover that they are um, teaching and preaching in the temple. Verse 25, Acts 5, 25. The men you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the, the people. So they brought them back. They invited them back. They didn't drag them back violently because now they were afraid. They were afraid of what might happen. Now, we're coming up on one of the great quotes of the New Testament. 
and one of the most important principles in the book of Acts. It's not an easy thing to understand. It seems clear, but it's a little bit complicated. They bring the men back in, and the council says to them, verse 28, We gave you strict orders not to teach in that name. You filled Jerusalem with this teaching, and you're trying to blame us for killing him. Well, they should have been blamed for killing him because they were the ones who killed him. The great principle is verse 29. Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. We must obey God rather than men. Now, I told you that it's not that simple. I told you it's a little bit complicated. What do I mean by that? Well, hold your place in Acts 5 and turn to Romans 13. Romans 13. The difficulty is that uh, more than once in Scripture, we are told to obey men. Uh, for instance, when you, when you read... Um, when you read the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2, 17, it says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. 1 Peter 2, 18, Servants, be submissive to your masters. Um, we're told to obey the government. We're told to obey our employers. Romans 13 says... Let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities. That's Romans 13, 1. How do you put this together? Well, I think it's fairly clear that if it's a matter of worship, and if it's a matter of obedience to a clear command of God, we cannot allow the government or any governing authority to violate our conscience. Now we have to count the cost. We have to understand that these men who give orders and make laws are powerful and they can hurt us if we don't do what they say. And Peter knew that he could be hurt. As a matter of fact, he was later executed by Rome. He was hurt. But he made up his mind, Acts 5.29, we're going to obey God rather than men. Now, as far as this business of blaming the priests for what had happened, look at what Peter says in Acts 5.30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death, by hanging him on a cross. It's clear he does blame them. Not only were they fighting the apostles, but they were fighting God because God raised up Jesus. God sent Jesus, and they killed God's own Son. He is the one whom God exalted the right hand to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Well, verse 33 says that when they were reminded of this, they, they really made up their minds again, we're going to kill these people. We're not going to let them teach these things in Jerusalem. We're going to kill them. Now, I said there were three great things that happened in chapter 5. One thing was the judgment on Ananias and Sapphira. One was the great ministry that the apostles had and the way they were opposed. They were imprisoned, they were released, and they bore witness to the council of Israel, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, and the high priests. The third great thing that happens in Acts 5 is what we call the Council of Gamaliel. The council which Gamaliel gave to the Sanhedrin. Now, when we studied John, some of you were with us during our study of John, we talked a little bit about the Sanhedrin, the council, the uh, ruling board when it came to theology or religious matters in Israel under the Romans. The Sanhedrin were dominated, was dominated by Sadducees, these people who cared really about politics and power. 
but there were a few Pharisees on the Sanhedrin, and the Pharisees were the religious elite. What they cared about was that people think of them as being holy and observing the law, keeping the law in the strictest way. And we noted at that time that Nicodemus, whom Jesus met in John chapter 3, and who with Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus after the Lord was crucified, that Nicodemus was one of those few Pharisees who had a seat on the Sanhedrin. So he was politically powerful and spiritually elite. Well, here we meet another Pharisee who is a member of the Sanhedrin, and his name is Gamaliel. And Gamaliel sees that they're about to go all out to kill the apostles. And he stands up in the middle of that conversation, and he tries to calm them down by saying this, wait a minute, if this movement is not of God, it will come to nothing. If it is of God, we can't stop it, and we don't want to be found opposing God. So, Acts chapter 5 begins with a great act of hypocrisy in the midst of the church with Ananias and Sapphira. Acts 5 ends with a great word of wisdom in the middle of the Sanhedrin from this man, Gamaliel. Now, most of you know, as we read from the book of Philippians, that Gamaliel was a great rabbi who taught students who were also becoming rabbis and learning the law. And one of his students was named Saul of Tarsus. One of his students became the most prominent Christian of the first century, Paul the Apostle. Did the teacher ever become a Christian? We don't know. We don't have any evidence that he did, but we can hope. Okay, so that's the story of Acts 5. The judgment upon Ananias and Sapphira, the ministry and imprisonment of the apostles with Peter's great resolution, we must obey God rather than men the debate within the Sanhedrin about what are we going to do with these men with the final counsel from Gamaliel. Um, we need to be sure that we're not fighting against God. That's a summary of Acts 5. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.